And now it's a great pleasure to introduce another speaker who will be joining us remotely, this time from Toronto, Canada. We have Alston Jakubiak, who is coming to us from University of Toronto. He's an assistant professor, and he also is director of engineering at Solema. And he's a building scientist, educator, architect, and he specializes in building performance and simulation, as well as post-occupancy evaluations. That's something that I really appreciate very much, Alston. And he actively develops new software as tools um, for tools, uh, new tools as part of his research. So combining research and development of tools that are put into practice. So Alston, you will be talking about faster and more complex, advancing daylight simulations for design, health, and comfort. So. Let's do it quickly. I'll ask you to take it away. And then uh, afterwards, we'll see you at the question and answer period, too. Thanks, Alston. All right, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, they, they put me in a hard session after all the free and open source uh, folks. So, but nonetheless, let's, let's go on. So there's been a lot of developments in daylight simulation over the past um, you know, decade or, or more, depending on how you frame your lens. Lots of new standards, each with their own measures from spatial daylight autonomy to the kind of like differential interpretations of EN 17037 um, to other, other types of measures that we see in other national standards and, and guidelines. So all of these things take you know, different types of simulations, different types of interpretations. Um, <laughs> We've seen developments in science from the from uh, you know the discovery of melanopsin, which is connected to our kind of non-visual behaviors, um, to you know like jumping forward uh, 20 years or so into the the new CIE uh, methods for how you quantify these lighting levels uh, for use in design, um, to even even other types of of works that are not cited here in terms of. Uh, visual discomfort or or visual excitement that we might we might uh, assess in the built environment. Um, all of these new measures and regulations, I, I think, have to have to compete with, uh, in a way, the the occupant and the dynamism of the space, which, which actually Stefan gave me a great introduction to this. Um, where you know individuals might you know decide to close the blinds or turn on the lights or turn off the lights um, or adjust the Venetian blinds uh, depending on their comfort and preferences and needs for privacy. And so, our, if we really want to understand what's going on in the built environment in terms of lighting, we we really want to. Um, produce simulations that can quantify this, or at least help us understand the ways in which it's influencing our results and our potential uh, final uh, constructions. Uh, beyond beyond uh, dynamism from occupants within the building, there's also, of course, dynamism outside of the building, right? Like, so especially for me in, in Toronto, uh, you know, there's, there's snow, it's, it's coming soon. And uh, you know that's going to change ground reflectance. It's going to have a massive impact on daylight levels inside the space, uh, certainly within urban spaces, but in extra urban spaces uh, even more so. And so uh, this is this is a kind of inconvenient thing that a lot of daylight workflows don't account for. And in fact, we're not accounting for it, Salima, either right now. But it's it's something that I want to put put forward as something that maybe needs a little extra consideration. And so. Today, I'm going to share three projects um, <clears throat> with, uh, with this you know, forum. Uh, first, on faster lighting simulations for close to real-time design feedback. Uh, second, on simulations for light and health. And third, on simulations of trees uh, in the built environment. And so um, I'm just going to run, run through these. Uh, so first, uh, lighting simulations for closer to <laughs> real-time design feedback, because real-time is, is difficult. Uh, this is with my company, Salema. So uh, the members being Demi, Timur, Violetta, Jeff, Christoph, and John. And uh, you know, I have to thank all of them uh, for the work we've put into this together. 
And we've, um, for, for better or worse, been in the kind of simulation front end space for quite some time. We released Diva for Rhino in 2011 and continued developing that up until about 2018. In 2017, we released a software called Alpha that helped us uh, you know, calculate uh, instead of RGB, but eight, uh, we calculate 81 uh, specific spectral irradiance channels. And in 2020, um, we released a new software called Climate Studio. And what I want to do uh, here is to spend a bit of time, uh, you know, describing not necessarily all the, the <laughs> benefits of new features of Climate Studio, but why it's faster and like why this might be a little bit important or interesting to think about. So in the past, um, DASIM or, or what Stefan referred to as the two-phase uh, DDS method, um, you know, would, would send out all the rays basically, wait, uh, depending on your, your ambient parameters for, the, for all of them to finish calculating and then display a result to you. Um, so a simulation of a really super east facing space like this, even on a modern, very fast laptop, might take a minute and 26 seconds. You might say a minute and 26 seconds, that's nothing, uh, which is true enough. Um, but once you apply this to more complex geometry, more complex materials, larger spaces, more detailed control systems, um, than just like an up-down roller blind, which is what's in this calculation, uh, you, you end up with calculations that might take hours or, or even days, uh, depending on the complexity. Um, but the, the, the truth of it is, is that most, most simple daylight simulations and even some more complex ones don't really need that much sampling. So like, like Stefan put forward, how you sample your design space is really important. And uh, equally important is how you decide when to stop sampling. Um, there are other tools in this workflow besides Ray Traverse, which actually I, I should have included on this slide, but I forgot. I'm sorry, Stefan. Um, that aim to improve the speed of daylight simulations using radiance. So there's Accelerad from Nathaniel Jones, which puts radiance on the GPU. It has some limitations, like there's no BSDFs in it, um, but it still can be really helpful. And there's also all of the, the multi-phase methods that have been put forth by all the, the great people who've worked on that, Greg Ward, Eleanor Lee, David Geisler, Maroder, uh, many, many more that I'm not going to name in this, in this list. Um, what we do at uh, in Climate Studio specifically is we run, we run standard radiance, but instead of sending out all the rays at once, we run a kind of pass-based system. So once, once you run your, once you create your octree, you just keep sending out rays and every, t every, uh, every group of rays will, will, will calculate and then finish and then the results will update and just be displayed to the user. So what this gives you is a kind of not real time precisely, but uh, you can visualize the ray trace results as it's, as they're occurring. And for a simple space like this, we can even see that after five seconds or so, you have basically zeroed in on your results. And after 10 or 15, you're certain, as a user, you would see this and say, oh, well, my, my SDA, which from pass to pass is changing by like 1% by, on a sensor. And then the average or the, the, the actual daylight area of the space is not changing at all. So it's very clear that you've come to a reasonable result. Um, so I wanted to kind of talk about this a little bit, and I'm going to start playing the video. Um, <clears throat> while we watch a kind of real-time calculation, and uh, to, to uh, yeah, there we go. Um, <clears throat> while we watch a real-time calculation, so this is a much more complicated space, right? You've got, you've got perimeter um, zones, you've got core zones, and um, you've got glazing in, in all 360 directions, basically. So each one of these pieces of glass needs to have its own kind of shading control. And this is a 100% glazed building, so you know it's going to get a little, um, a little crazy in terms of the blind operation. Um, so you know, once once we start seeing some results here, we can we can kind of understand that you know if you think about this from a typical daylight sim simulation standpoint without dynamic blinds. You would expect the south to be most daylit. This is in Toronto, but in fact, no, because the blind use is so heavy, the north is actually the best daylit by by IES LM83, spatial daylight autonomy at least. And we can start to understand why. Right? We can see that the blinds uh, on the west are closed in the afternoon, the blinds in the south are closed most of the day, the blinds in the east are closed in the morning. Um, if you break this down into kind of hourly 
um, data just to visualize um, what's going on, um, which is what's happening now. I've got I talked ahead of my pre-recorded video. It becomes very obvious, right? Like you know, direct sunlight comes in, and you know we can, it's, this is a kind of untenable direct sunlight situation. You would never not have blinds in in these kinds of in this kind of uh, design space. Um, so it is a little concerning in some ways that that many calculation methods don't really count on this as something important. As I'm super happy to see it in other presentations today. I'm going to jump to the next slide. Oh, well, not yet. Uh, one other thing here that is that you know there's some question I think also about you know what blind algorithms do we use? How do we present this information? How do we make it understandable to other people? And this is something that we're working on, but I don't necessarily have a full answer for yet, but I, I want to raise this as something to consider. Uh, second project is dynamic simulation for light and health. This is with uh, my students from the University of Toronto, Athena Light and Lena Ma. And I don't have to go over to this, the, the background science of this too much because the previous uh, daylight, daylight stage session was on non-image forming lighting and, and circadian effects. Um, but you know, basically melanopsin has been discovered in, in the past 20 years. It's a photoreceptor in the eye that's non-image forming. It's more sensitive to blue light than our photopic um, system. And it has influence on, on our well-being and health. So it advances or delays our circadian rhythms, suppresses melatonin in the evening, can have instantaneous alerting and Cognitive improving effects and, and has been shown that you know, with proper timing and and color properties and intensity can be used to help regulate uh, regulate sleep wake behavior and treat uh, sleep related disorders and help patients with dementia and things like that. It's also led to new units such as equivalent melanopic lux and melanopic irradiance and even uh, melanopic uh, equivalent daylight illuminance, which uh, is a little funny to me because you know we don't say for photopic lux how much B65 illuminance we need to get the same photopic signal. We just say lux, but nonetheless. Uh, so there's new units that have emerged to quantify these these types of effects. And new metrics as well, like well, the well standard, Maria Mundo Tier's non-visual direct response model, uh, Medalevich and Anderson's non-visual effects kind of binning of daylight uh, responses. And so, you know, as we're learning these new units, we're also bringing in new new measures that help us try to understand how should we design for this new science? And it, it's all a little complicated. Actually, the, the, the three standards here use three different units, um, equivalent melanopic lux, melanopic irradiance, and, and uh, kind of a quasi-photopic illuminance. Um, but it's, it shows that things are moving forward in a certain direction. And if we want to calculate this, and this, here's, here's where I come in, in, in in many ways. If we want to calculate this, uh, we need to know lots of stuff. We need to know the color metric properties of the sky. Uh, we need to know the properties of the glass, the properties of opaque materials, the spectrum and strength and distribution of electric lighting, as well as screen devices. And so that's a that's a whole lot of data in order to get a kind of spectral irradiance calculation at the eye, in which we can then calc can convert to equivalent mel melanopic flux or melanopic irradiance or our melanopic EDI, and then assess in some way. And we know this is important. We can just look out our window and understand that we perceive the built environment differently when we have a different kind of source or a different kind of material reflectance. And so the, the most difficult and perhaps most onerous of these things we need to quantify is in fact the sky. Uh, the sky is, is super difficult, it's dynamic, it's, it's spatially and spectrally discrete, um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's just difficult to model. Um, so we can see some measurements from, uh, from my colleague Priji Balakrishnan at the TU Berlin here, um, normalized to 555 nanometers, uh, really showing the, the wide variety of characters the sky can take on. Uh, and that's this, these are total irradiance measurements, but if you break it down by, by a luminance distribution across the sky dome, it gets even harder. And so there's lots of different ways that have emerged to calculate this in practice, you know, just applying a CIE spectra, using kind of luminance correlations from the Perez model, 
uh, or for measurement, uh, physics-driven models with RedTran or MCRATs, or, or even direct measurement, and then just applying that direct measurement into a simulation model. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to leave you hanging on what, what is best there, but I, it's a, it's an ongoing field. Uh, everything else is a little simpler. Uh, materials can just be measured because they're static for the most part. So I, I run, for example, a, a database of opaque material measurements called spectraldb.com. Um, and you know when you click on a material, you get a kind of spectral measurement. Um, the sensors to measure these get a little bit more pricey, but it is in principle something that can be done. Transmission materials are, are easy to come by. Uh, most glasses are, are spectrally quantified and can be looked up in the International Glazing Database or, or produced using LBNL optics. Um, and the time series part, you know, it, it gets a little heavier in terms of the data because instead of, you know, a single um, luminance channel or a RGB three channel, you have uh, maybe 81 or even more uh, spectral irradiance channels, uh, but in principle, it works. It can work the same. You know, we can we can identify representative solar positions uh, for Toronto, for example, uh, scale them by climate data, run simulations, and get and get con a continuous daylight signal. We can put blinds in there and and understand how blinds influence that. For electric lighting, we can take photometric data from IES files, combine those with S spectral power distributions. For monitor screens, we can take spectral power distributions from, from direct measurement or from known sources, such as fluxometer.com's uh, rainbow uh, subpage. And I think what's particularly challenging about light and health is that you know um, uh, many measures kind of say daylight alone or electric lighting alone, but really we're experiencing all, all of these things simultaneously, both daylight and electric lighting and lighting from our screens. And so if we want to really understand the effects the com combination all this has on a person, we need to combine them. And to do that, we need to understand how they're controlled. So how is daylight controlled? How is electric lighting controlled? Do we dim the lights? Do we do we color shift our solid state lighting in the evening? Do uh, for monitors, do we do we keep it always at 6,500 Kelvin or do we drop it down to reduce the blue the blue light in the evening? And even control of the occupants, like where what do people do? Do they go outside for lunch? Do they walk to work? Do they stay inside the building? How much does the building itself matter when you have the outdoors? So all of these are questions that I'm not answering in this presentation, but I think <laughs> are important questions to ask basically. Um, and just as a just as an example, we uh, we put together a kind of uh, calculation using the Postnova uh, and colleagues photobiological effects model, um, which is a pretty uh, complex model. We run it at a 20 second illuminance interval or radiance interval. It accounts for sleep wake. It accounts for kind of dueling homeostatic and circadian systems that are influenced by light and sleep. And you know it can spit out things like subjective sleepiness on an hour by hour basis or reaction time predictions on an hour by hour basis um, or melatonin suppression. And so, you know, tools are starting to move in a direction where we can calculate these direct physical effects on people that are influenced by light. Um, there's still a lot of kind of work to be done in validation, but there you are. I'm going to just skip through a couple of slides because I took too long talking about some things. But last project, and I'm going to go through it in about two and a half minutes, is the impact of trees. Uh, so this is with Priji Balakrishnan and Jesse Pan. And you know, trees are very interesting. They're an aspect of the outdoor environment that are difficult to, to model and difficult to simulate in a certain sense. Uh, they have lots of interesting properties, their dimensionality, how much light passes through their canopies, and I uh, think most specifically here, the seasonality. So when do the leaves senesce? When do they change color? When do they drop? When do they regrow? Uh, it's a dynamic out exterior environment that can significantly impact daylight levels, right? Um, so over the summer and, and previously during Purdue's PhD, uh, we kind of embarked on a process of measuring trees, which, which you know involves photographing them against a kind of uh, clear sky, converting that into, into direct gap and transmission uh, through the trees. Um, and then over this summer, we, we, did, we specifically put together a kind of um, deciduous tree model where you know, it starts as branches only, the leaves slowly grow in and turn green, 
uh, during fall, they senesce and turn yellow and then slowly, and slowly, slowly leave and then you're in the branches again. Um, and what's interesting uh, was we looked at the 12 most common trees in Vancouver and they have a huge variety of, of properties that are very different from, from how much light passes through the canopy to how tall they are, to the, to the physical dimensions they take up on the site in terms of their tree canopy diameters, but also even in terms of their color properties and when, when their leaves grow in, how long they last into the winter. Um, and once you start putting these in front of a building, um, you can get some pretty uh, interesting and striking differences. So, I, um, you know, in this case, I'm just comparing three results. And the left-hand side is no trees. The middle side is a is our best performing tree in this simulation model, the Fraxinus americana. And the right-hand side is another is another dynamic deciduous tree, the Betula pendula. Um, we get differences in in kind of usable daylight of up to like 15% between these models. And differences in the number of hours that blinds are closed by by you know 350 hours in some cases, um, so they can really have strong impacts not only on daylight but also on view. And last slide here, um, also on on energy potentially. Um, so without going too much over this slide, we we calculated daylight dynamic daylight, we calculated blinds, we calculated sunlight exposure, um, but we also applied these kind of deciduous shading profiles and differential electric lighting uses to an, an energy model. And we could find differences in, uh, in thermal requirements by up to 10%, depending on you know, tree selection and placement, which um, you know, is, is, is not you know, going to give you a net zero building, um, but it's not nothing either. And so, you know, thank you is always is always appropriate at the end of this, both to my collaborators and to those, those who listen. And I hope that, you know, I've pointed out some interesting things to talk about in terms of what simulations can do and can't do and what they maybe they should do. And so I'm really looking forward to the discussion.